perhaps the least known and understood front in the Great War was the battle over East Africa. Their colonial troops from Britain, Belgium, Portugal, and Germany fought in an area that was larger than France, Germany, and England combined in an effort to divert each other's resources. The German colonies in West Africa all fell within the first year and a half of war, but East Africa became a protracted conflict. And one way to illustrate the futility of that conflict is to talk about a lesser known front in the lesser known front of the Great War, and that was the efforts to control Lake Nyasa, a colonial backwater characterized by poor supply, confusion, and command neglect. Lake Nyasa was the location of the first naval battle of the First World War. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Lake Malawi is one of the African Great Lakes, a series of lakes that are part of the Rift Valley Lakes. The lake, with a surface area of more than 11,000 square miles, is 350 miles long and 47 miles wide at its widest point. The lake borders the modern states of Malawi, Tanzania, and Mozambique. But in 1914, the lake, referred to by the British as Lake Nyasa, straddled the border between the British protectorates of Nyasa land, formerly known as British Central Africa, and northern Rhodesia, their Portuguese allied colony Mozambique, and German East Africa and thus represented an important strategic feature in the little-known East Africa campaign of the First World War. While fighting in the north, where German East Africa bordered British East Africa and the Belgian Congo was relatively more important to the conflict, Lake Nyasa had strategic importance. The ability to control the lake meant the ability to move troops and supplies and maintain lines of communication in a campaign that, unlike the war in Europe, was highly mobile and one in which lack of supply killed more troops than bullets. As the region was remote, even by colonial standards, resources were limited on both sides. At the outbreak of war, the troops available to Nyasaland were largely concentrated around Fort Johnston at the south end of Lake Malawi. Fort Johnston was named after the British colonial administrator Sir Harry Johnston and is today called Mangochi. But there was a concern. If the British could not guarantee control of the lake, then Nyasaland could not guarantee control of its north, as it was difficult to move troops and supply to defend it. Control of the lake was, thus, the difference between whether Nyasa land was thrown on the defensive. But British control of the lake was by no means guaranteed, because on a lake so remote that it was extraordinarily difficult to bring up a new vessel, one single vessel of war could control the entire lake, and the Germans had such a vessel, the steamer Hermann von Wismann. The 87-foot, 100-ton, single-screw steamship was built in 1890 by the Hamburg Johnson and Schelinski shipyard. The ship was built in sections in Germany and shipped to East Africa. It was then transported overland and launched on Lake Nyasa in September 1893. The ship was christened SMS Hermann von Wismann, named after a German explorer and administrator who had commanded German troops who put down an 1888 insurrection by the Arab and Swahili population of German East Africa that was called the Abashiri Revolt. While Wismann had been criticized for his brutal tactics in the Abashiri Revolt, he was an ardent anti-slaver, and he had funded the construction of the steamer on Lake Nyasa as a gunboat designed to fight the transport of slaves across the lake. In 1891, the steamer had played a role in efforts to oust a Swahili Arab slave trader named Mlozi, who had established a stronghold on the north end of the lake. Interestingly, von Wismann had also funded the construction of a sister ship named after his wife, called the Hedwig von Wismann, that was placed on Lake Tanganyika in the north. That ship was the model for the gunboat the Queen Louise that was the target of characters Charlie Allnut and Rose Sayer in the 1951 film The African Queen. The determination to sink the Queen Louise that the characters played by Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn display in the movie are reminiscent of the determination that the British forces put into trying to remove the threat of her real-life sister ship on Lake Nyasa. At the outbreak of war, the Hermann von Wismann was one of only three armed boats on Lake Nyasa. As there was a fear the von Wismann might capture other transport steamers and then use them to move an invasion force, all the Nyasa land steamers, numbers are unclear, but around 8 to 10 boats, were called to the south end of the lake where most were requisitioned for military service. The British answer to the Hermann von Wismann was the 130-foot armed steamer SS Gwendolen. Named after British author Lady Gwendolen Cecil, the Gwendolen was constructed in Fort Johnston in 1898. The Gwendolen should have been more than a match for the Hermann von Wismann as it was built to carry four three-pounder cannons. The ship was capable of delivering 300 armed troops with equipment, and when launched, the British had declared her the finest steamship ever to sail on the lake. But there was legitimate reason for concern. The Gwendolen had a history of mechanical breakdowns and suffered from construction deficiencies. 
While the ship had been designed to carry four three-pounder cannons, she had only ever been outfitted with one, located on the main deck, where it had a limited range of fire. There was a serious shortage of ammunition for even that one gun, and the crew had not been trained in its use. By comparison, the Hermann von Wismann mounted the one-pounder gun called the pom-pom, so called for the sound it made when firing. While the British were unsure of how many of the guns the ship had, some thought four, others said just one, the one-pounder had advantages over the three-pounder. Essentially a very large machine gun, the one-pounder actually had a greater effective firing range and a much faster rate of fire. The Hermann von Wismann had at least one mounted on its foredeck, giving a much better field of fire. Thus, the Hermann von Wismann would have advantages both in range and maneuver. If the two boats met, the Hermann von Wismann might be able to destroy Gwendolyn before she was even in range. At very least, the two boats were matched well enough that the outcome would be in question, and the loss of the Gwendolyn would leave the lake essentially in German hands. The senior British naval officer advised to avoid an encounter. However, there was information that the Hermann von Wismann was laid up for repairs at the German port at the south end of the lake called Sphinxhaven, so-called because large rocks in the water resemble sphinxes. The ship might be vulnerable, but surely the outbreak of war on July 28th would have prompted the Germans to speed the repairs and to properly guard the ship. With slow communication lines and indecision, Gwendolyn was finally dispatched August 8th on a mission with conflicting orders and against the advice of her captain, Edmund Rhodes. The lack of confidence in the Gwendolyn was expressed in the orders to the ship. The Gwendolyn will proceed with caution and instructions have been issued for her to not risk an encounter which might prove disastrous to her. But if it is ascertained that the Visman is still undergoing repairs, endeavor will be made to put her out of service unless Finkshaven is too strongly defended. The lack of confidence showed in a report by Chief Secretary Hector Duff to Sir George Smith, Governor of Nyasaland. If Gwendolyn meets German ship in open, will do as well as possible. To complicate matters, Gwendolyn had been sent with a troop of the King's African Rifles, who, if possible, could be landed nearby to reconnoiter. But the troop had been given the odd order to, on no account, do so much damage as to absolutely destroy the von Wismann. The orders, it seems, were to disable the ship, but leave it in a state that it could be repaired, as it was hoped that the ship would eventually be captured. That would be a difficult feat against a vessel that was very much capable of defeating the Gwendolyn. British fears were realized when an official reported seeing an unidentified steamer on the lake, suggesting the Hermann von Wismann was repaired and active. And so on August 13th, 1914, two ships of war, neither one large, but both very important to their tiny part of the war, were about to engage in what could be the decisive battle for the control of Lake Nyasa and what would be the first naval battle of the First World War. In fact, the fact that the first naval battle of the war occurred on distant Lake Nyasa is proof that the war was a world war. And that much anticipated and feared battle was anticlimactic. When Gwendolyn arrived at Sphinxhaven, not only did they find the Hermann von Wismann still laid up for repairs, but the port was completely undefended. The captain and crew of the Hermann von Wismann had not yet been informed that Germany and Britain were at war. While the government of German East Africa had been informed of the declaration, Sphinxhaven was a remote outpost, and word had simply not gotten there. If Rhodes ever filed an official report, it has been lost, and while there are many stories, there are no actual contemporary accounts of the battle. What we do know is that the Gwendolyn fired on the laid-up Hermann von Wismann, and the ship's captain, a man named Brandt, rowed a boat out to the Gwendolyn to demand an explanation, only to be taken as a prisoner of war. Some popular accounts have Brandt yelling, God damn, Rhodes! Are you drunk? Although that is likely apocryphal. The ship's chief engineer was found in his bunk and also taken prisoner. The troops from the Gwendolyn then removed the von Wismann's gun and other equipment so as to render her disabled. The steamer the British resident had reported operating on the lake was apparently him mistaking the Gwendolyn. Governor Smith reported to London, We are now in command of the lake and have all steam vessels under our control. Thus went the first great naval victory for the Royal Navy in the Great War. The victory allowed the British to release the other steamers for operation, allowing them to concentrate a part of the Nyasaland field force on the border with German East Africa that in September, and with the help of fire from the Gwendolyn, defeated a German force of approximately equal size, the only significant action of the war to take place in Nyasaland. 
but the British were still worried that the Germans would repair and come calling with the Hermann von Wismann. The British made several more raids to the still largely undefended port, doing more damage to the ship and destroying workshops and spare parts. Slowly, supplies and reinforcements arrived at Fort Johnston, and the Gwendolyn had two additional six-pounder guns mounted. Control of the lake seemed assured, but then a new threat emerged. In October, the German light cruiser SMS Konigsberg had been trapped in the Rufiji River in German East Africa by a British naval squadron. Konigsberg was blockaded, but several of her large guns had been removed, and now there was a rumor that one of the large guns was being taken to Sphinxhaven to mount on the Hermann von Wismann. While the local authorities knew the rumors were likely false, they could not be ignored, as the guns were large enough to challenge any boat on the lake. In May 1915, a mission was dispatched to put an end to the threat by attempting to capture and refloat the Hermann von Wismann, then assumed to be under repairs. The Gwendolyn, along with a smaller armed boat, the Chauncey Maples, conveyed more than 200 troops for the mission. This time there was a force of German Ascaris, native troops, defending the port, and in a spirited battle, a British volunteer, a noted elephant hunter named Jimmy Sutherland, was killed. The Germans defended a redoubt, which the Gwendolyn shelled with her six-inch guns, but as the ship only had armor-piercing ammunition and no shrapnel, caused few if any casualties. When the British finally took the redoubt, they found the German force had escaped, leaving behind a single defender to be taken prisoner, a dachshund. Only two men, Sutherland and a single German Ascari casualty, were known to die in the fight. But the force soon found that the Hermann von Wismann was not being repaired at all, and once again the British obsession with the vessel was far greater than any apparent German interest. Because of all the damage that they themselves had done, it was clear the ship would take more than a month to repair, while German reinforcements were on their way. In fact, the troops had to re-embark under fire. The tiny battle, which was presented as a victory as the Hermann von Wismann was finally decided to be beyond repair, received outsized enthusiasm in Britain, where any good news was highly prized in the face of the huge losses being taken in Europe. The Royal Navy finally sunk the Konigsberg in July of 1915, but her big guns, which had been removed, were used throughout the East African campaign, and that meant that the ghost of the Konigsberg continued to worry Allied officials throughout the campaign. The little-remembered East African campaign was the result of a force in German East Africa under German General Paul Emil von Leto Vorbeck, whose role it was to divert as many Allied troops and resources as possible. The campaign was the longest of the war and resulted in nearly 60,000 European casualties and hundreds of thousands of casualties among native troops and porters, most of whom died of disease and starvation. As the campaign moved, they destroyed crops and villages, leading to both famine and greater susceptibility to the 1918 influenza pandemic. Millions died as a result. As much as 20% of the population of German East Africa, including the modern-day countries of Burundi, Rwanda, and most of Tanzania, died as a result of the conflict and the influenza. One British colonial official remarked that the losses in East Africa were not a scandal only because the people who suffered most were the carriers, and after all, who cares about native carriers? While this tiny fight over the Hermann von Wismann, which the Germans never managed to sail during the course of the war and didn't even bother to try to repair, might seem irrelevant, it actually was meaningful. It meant the British had control over Lake Nyasa, which protected lines of transport, of communication, and of supply. And because the British controlled Lake Nyasa, they were able to, in 1916, take a combined Rhodesia-Nyasa field force under the command of General Sir Edward Northey and invade German East Africa almost without opposition. And at that point, the Hermann von Wismann was captured by the British, repaired and renamed the HMS King George. The ship continued to sail on Lake Nyasa clear until 1950. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>